Should be recording. Make sure, double check. Oh yeah. Should be able to go. Okay, I think I, I think we're good. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Rick Chacon from the Department of Sociology, Criminology, and Anthropology. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the second event in our Distinguished Scholar Lecture Series. Uh, as you may recall, hey, good to see you. As you may recall, our first event was uh, Dr. Gleb Alexandrov from the Institute for African Studies in Moscow. And our second event here is our, our distinguished guest that I'm gonna introduce in a moment. But before I do that, I wanna publicly thank and acknowledge Dr. The, the chair of the department, Dr. Jeannie Hubbard, who's, I don't think, I don't see her here, but nevertheless, I do wanna acknowledge and thank her for her steadfast uh, support uh, for the anthropology program. All right, so let us begin. Dr. Brian Billman is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. His research interests include the origins of states, the evolution of human violence, household archaeology, settlement pattern analysis, and heritage preservation. He has more than 40 years of research experience in Peru and the United States, including the Southwest, Rocky Mountains, and California. In addition to his academic research, Professor Bildman has directed numerous community and heritage and economic development projects in rural communities in the Moche Valley of Peru. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest, Dr. Brian Bildman. The floor is yours. You should be working. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Rick, for that, uh, uh, that generous introduction. And uh, thank you to Winthrop and the Department of uh, Sociology, Criminology, and Anthropology for inviting me today. It, it occurs to me, it's kind of curious that anthropologists are in a program with criminologists, given the behavior, some of the behaviors anthropologists engage in in the field. Uh, but uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm on sabbatical, not currently teaching. So I haven't uh, taught or presented in front of a, of a live audience in about a year and a half because we've been remote teaching. So uh, I may be a little rusty, uh, but we'll see. And uh, it's just, it's good. It's uh, good to be doing something that's not on Zoom where everyone has their camera off and I have no idea if anyone is even in the room out there. Uh, I appreciate the turnout. It's a great turnout here for a Friday. Uh, happy to see people turn out to hear an obscure topic, uh, the moche of the, of the north coast of Peru. So we'll uh, jump in here. Slides are working. Uh, so the main thing I study is, uh, is state formation, the origins of social complexity. And uh, we're in the process of uh, Doing, uh, coming up with position requests at, at UNC and archaeology. And uh, one of uh, the younger colleagues in the program, uh, perhaps without uh, thinking, commented on it that uh, we wanted, that one thing we didn't want to hire was someone who studied so the origins of social complexity, uh, given that it's no longer a relevant issue in anthropology. Ouch. Uh, I pointed out to him that that's what I've been doing for the last 40 years, but it's okay. I can be a dinosaur, right? No problem. So why, why state formation? And one of the things I want you to take away from this talk is that we have all this idea that state formation is something that happened long ago, far away in places like Egypt and Mesopotamia and China uh, some places in sub-Saharan Africa, central Mexico, and the Andes, and that it's, it's not, you know, it's something that happened long ago, not relevant to the modern world. Uh, but I would, I would say that when we're talking about state formation, we're talking about a process. And this is a process in which the few gain control politically over the many. 
and that processes of state formation go on all the time around us. Wherever you see the formation of institutions or organizations uh, where a few, select few, have control or power over the many, that's a process of state formation. Uh, we've actually just come to a, a, an amazing age of state formation. If we went back um, before World War II, 100 and so years ago, um, nearly all of the planet was controlled by a few nation states. Uh, now there are more than 190 nation states in the world. First decolonization, then the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union. Uh, we have ex actually live in an age where new states are created or fall apart all the time. That said, we're going to go back in time far away to a distant place here. Um, so I have a, a lot here, and I, I, I've, I've crammed together several things. But what I want, want to do is to give you an idea of the history of investigation of my work pondering um, what the Moche state was and theories about why it formed. And so we're going to go through these first topics. So first to introduce this house, I work on what's called the Southern Moche State. Uh, there are generally considered two areas, two Moche areas, cleverly named Northern and uh, Southern Moche area. Archaeologists are not poets. Uh, we name things like Mound A, Mound B, and so on. So we're not all that clever. Uh, I work on the Southern Moche State. In the Northern sphere, it's a more fragmented area politically, or was with many different small political organizations. But an argument can be made that in the Southern sphere, there emerged uh, a dominant political organization in the Moche Valley that eventually uh, encompassed several valleys on the North Coast and came to demise somewhere in the AD 800s. So locator slide here. So we have Lima, about 300 miles north, the Moche Valley, Nazca Valley here to the south. Uh, the coast of Peru is, uh, has the second highest mountain range in the world, the Andes, uh, the world's driest desert, and one of the world's richest marine fisheries on the planet. Still today, it's been uh, now, intensive exploitation of fish for 5,000 years, and it's still producing surpluses. Uh, the result of this is that we have an ecology, uh, an environmental situation in which people can produce surpluses, sustainable surpluses for long periods of time. And to support states, to support state organizations and elite classes and artisans and cities, you need sustainable surplus production. So uh, I want to begin talking about the Moche. Uh, this period, about 200 AD to 800, we see five major transformations going on in the river valley and then spreading across the north coast. The first of these is the construction of massive amounts of monumental architecture, huge platform mounds. And uh, I know not everyone uh, thinks in terms of cubic meters like I do, uh, but just to give you a scale, these are some of the first monuments constructed on the coast. We go through a period of abandonment, and this is when the Moche State forms. We're looking at almost a million 300,000 cubic meters of construction. So even if you can't visualize that, you can see it goes off the scale. So uh, the largest of these monuments, in fact, the largest uh, uh, mud brick structure in the New World is Waka del Sol. This is the Moche capital here. Uh, it's the site of Moche in the Moche Valley near the town of Moche, where the Moche culture originated. So again, archaeologists are not poets. Um, now, if we, uh, if we look at the mound here, it's actually just a facade. Uh, two thirds of the mound, more than two thirds of the mound is gone. 
Uh, the Spanish in the 1500s sold mineral rights uh, to a mining corporation, and they diverted the Moche River and hydraulic mined two thirds of the monument away. What were they after? They were after uh, royal Moche tombs loaded with gold and silver. As we'll see, some of the finest gold and silver artwork ever produced, all of it was taken to a foundry in Trujillo and melted down into gold gold and silver bars. Um, everyone's an art critic, right? <laughs> Originally, it was built up out of 140 million adobe bricks. Um, an adult in fairly good health can produce about 100 adobe bricks in a day. So this is the marshalling of an enormous amount of labor by leaders. It was not, wasn't done out all at once. It was done in at least five episodes, massive episodes of construction. If we look across from Huaca de la Luna or Huaca del Sol, we see Huaca de la Luna, um, which is a smaller mound, a mere 40 million adobe bricks with a massive courtyard and compound. Uh, also, also mined by the Spanish, these are mine shafts and there are two open pit mines on top of it, which you can see here, this is back dirt from these open pit mines to get at uh, Moche Royal tombs. And this brings us to our next transformation. They're building massive mounds in a new style of architecture for new types of public ritual, not be see seen before on the coast. Uh, these are depicted in Moche artwork, and there was speculation about whether these actually happened. We now know they did. And one of the main rituals we see is human sacrifice. And a phrase, crazy French Canadian archaeologist named uh, Steve Bourget uh, got permission to do excavations here and uncovered in this enclosure, which deliberately surrounds a uh, rock outcrop here which mimics the mountain behind it, found the remains of 80 young men who had been systematically uh, tortured, held captive, and then their throats slit, uh, had their blood drain, and then the back of their heads bashed in. In four events, moche human sacrifice, in fact, exists, and it's a new form of ritual that that comes in this phase. Um, the third transformation is what the Spanish were after. Royal tombs filled with extraordinary quantities of artwork, of wealth. Uh, all of these have been looted by the Spanish or by later looters, but at Sipan, Walter Alva, it's a great story. He was able to save this, a series of five royal tombs from the looters, and we now for the first time see what was in these royal tombs. Extraordinary gold and silver artifacts, as well as pottery, gems, jewelry. And this is the sort of thing that the Spanish melted down and turned into bricks. These are ear spools. Uh, so there's a, a, on the back of them, there's about an inch in diameter post that would go through the ears. The Spanish called the the nobles of the Inca, orejones, or big ears, because they had these big earlobes from the sign of status. So it's about palm shaped. Uh, so we have turquoise with dozens of pieces of uh, gold, which then are soldered together to create this 3D mosaic. What this indicates, if we look at the range of burials is the development of hereditary class differences, economic differences, not just status, uh, a royal class, but then a noble priestly class, a middle class of craftsmen and retainers, and then probably 95% of the people uh, are the farmers and fisher. Those are the 95% that I study. The 95% of Moche archeologists study the top 5%. And you know, royal tombs are coal, right? I mean, why not? Not everyone's into garbage like I am. Now with this, we get a change in ideology, a change in religion, 
represented by iconography. So iconography is symbols on artwork, right? And this is the Moche deity or presumed to be, this is who they're sacrificing young men to. Uh, there are elements of this that come from earlier periods. The crossed incisors is very old style Andean religious tradition, but he is, he's a new creation. I say he, but I don't know their gender. So uh, I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, so we get this artwork and big, huge friezes on public buildings on those monuments, polychrome friezes like this one. This is all original paint too, original paint and clay. Um, but uh, much of it occurs on pottery represented in these elaborate fine line drawings. And this is a rollout that shows a series of scenes that appears to indicate a royal burial down into a chamber tomb in one of these mounds with the coffin there. Um, and uh, one of the coffins that Sipan actually had a metal faceplate on it, just like this guy. So Moche were oftentimes very literal in their portrayals of the work. This is the presentation scene. This is the human sacrifice scene that would have taken place at Waka de la Luna. And it's an elite member of society actually here that's being sacrificed. And uh, so we have a bottom element here, a top element. The blood is drawn and then given to this figure um, in, a, in a cup to be consumed. Uh, another representation of combat and human sacrifice here as well. This is what pre-Moche art looks like. It's a little bit of a change. So here's Moche, here's pre-Moche. Uh, so we have a small, probably a relatively small group of extraordinarily talented artists who presumably their patrons are the elite members of society. And uh, this is, these pieces are you know, worth tens of thousands of dollars on the art market, the illegal art market. So Moche sites are horribly looted as a result. But it's more than that, uh, because at Waka de la Luna, there are ceramic workshops for the mass production of pottery, mass production of domestic wares for cooking and storage, but also the mass production of ceremonial wares. I call these sort of the Walmart wares of the, of the moche. So you have this sort of fine art for the upper strata, but images from that fine art are being taken off and knocked off and produced in, in molds. One workshop had more than a thousand molds in it. It had uh, a matrix, the positive of the negative of the mold for mass producing molds. Um, and from my excavation, our excavation in households, we find that these, these items make it down to the lowest strata. And in fact, female figurines, which are mass produced single piece molds are found in the humblest domestic kitchen broken in the hearth. So this religion is not just of the elite, it's reaching down into the masses and to, to do your rituals at home, you need pieces of these pottery that are coming from a workshop at Waka de la Luna. This is sort of, I also think it is this propaganda, right? This is religious, religious art in support of the state. So if we put all these things together, what we're seeing is a profound change in the relationship between leaders and followers. We see a profound change in the power relationship. For the first time on the coast, leaders have ideological power, the control of a brand new state religion, economic power in the control of irrigation systems and craft specialists, and also military power, as we'll see, control of armies who go out and do what armies do, conquer other areas. So as an ambitious young uh, grad student, um, I set out to test general theories of state formation, which gives me a little bit of chuckle, you know? Like they say, get your grad students young while they still know it all. <laughs> So uh, these are sort of three standard theories of state formation. These go way back. I mean, they, Confucius and Plato wrote about state formation. 
Um, so I was going to test irrigation and social stratification. My read of the literature and what was being written said that warfare was not a factor. So my NSF proposal discounted warfare as a factor. Turns out I was wrong. Warfare turned out to be very significant. So I set out uh, to spend a year in Peru and to survey the middle Moche Valley in the foothills of the Andes, and then combine that survey with a survey of the lower valley that had been done in the 1970s that had been not, not been published. And Mike Mosley very generously gave me all the data, all the site forms from that, um, from his project. So I set out to survey the valley, find early sites, find households at those early sites, dig those households, and test theories of irrigation and social stratification. Uh, things went a little bit differently. Uh, first of all, the economy of Peru was in shambles, and they eliminated, right before I came down, they eliminated subsidies on gasoline, and gas overnight went from 20 cents a gallon to $2.50 a gallon. Imagine if that happened in the US. And they woke up, they went to bed one night and it was 25 cents a gallon. And they woke up in the morning and it was $2.50. All price controls had been removed. This is major shock to the economy. So my, my budget was built on 25 cents a gallon. The other thing is that based on the work that my mentor had done in the Nazca Valley, I estimated that I could survey about five kilometers three miles of the valley margin a day. When it was all said and done, a half kilometer a day. So 10 times longer. And one of the reasons why it took so much longer, the, the margin was continuous archeological site, artifacts and architecture. The big problem was breaking it into sites and trying to record it. But then, because remember I said warfare wasn't a factor? Warfare was a big, such a big factor in time periods that people lived in places like this for defensive reasons. So I had to spend the next 12 months climbing up top of mountains and recording sites like, uh, like that. It turned out this is the frontier between coastal people and highland people. And uh, very early on conflict developed between those folks over the middle valley. Uh, this is the upper end of the survey area, about six months a year. It tends to be foggy and overcast. I drove out in the morning with Flor Diaz, who was working with me from the University of Trujillo, a student. The socked in, and we started climbing up a ridge, and then we climbed through the fog, and the visibility was like 100 miles around, but it was just table flat. I turned and took this picture, and then I felt this warm wind whipping up the valley, and in 15 minutes, the fog cleared. Uh, this was literally the high point on my survey. This is about 1,200 meters, and uh, it gives you some idea. So we had spent the day climbing this ridge, parking the vehicle here and coming up, found seven sites on this, and then spent the day walking back, recording those sites. This was the last piece of survey because I reserved it for last because I had no idea how we we're gonna do this. Had to get up on this ridge and there were sites all along this ridge top. And then you see these ridges coming off. On each of these ridges, there are archeological sites. Most of them with fortifications, right? Uh, ending in cliffs. So this was the next piece that we took on. And I just barely got the survey done um, in 13 months. Uh, these are some of the sites. It's hyper arid. It never rains except during El Nino's every 20, 30 years. So you get beautifully preserved architecture. These are, you know, sort of locations that I would find sites in up on tops and upper ridges. So we'd have to work our way up here. This is all, this modeling here is uh, rubble from, from wallfall. Uh, ceremonial sites. This is a, a sort of medium-sized ceremonial complex. This is all an artificial terrace with a series of mounds on it. If you go up to the ridge above it, that ridge that you saw from that one photo, we're hiking along and I see this. I move in and it's a classic 
formative period U-shaped mound on this ridge a thousand meters above the valley floor. Pristine. Wakamena Kucho, earliest mound. This is that first period of political formation uh, in the formative period. Uh, there are a series of mounds built in the valley and then we'll see they're abandoned. Prehistoric canals. Uh, now irrigation has expanded above prehistoric irrigation, but until about 19, sometime in the 1990s, prehistoric irrigation on the North Coast was more extensive than modern irrigation. Fields, agricultural fields, and forts and fortifications, lots of them. This is a fortified town site. This is uh, up on a parapet. So a parapet is a breastwork. You get up on a wall and then you have a step there, a platform, and then a wall that comes up to about here. So you can stand up there and sling stones and, and uh, whatnot at people. So this site is actually Chimu, which is later. This is probably, let's say about 1200 AD. And uh, this is a pile of sling stones still sitting on this parapet covered by lichen. So it's sat there for seven, 800 years. Uh, in place. Um, well, how do I know these sling stones? These are sling stones. Uh, they're rounded. So they've come up from the valley bottom. Everything else is sharp uh, because it never rains, so stuff doesn't get, get rolled. I discovered very quickly that everything was very loose. It's not stabilized by vegetation and everything is sharp. So whenever you fall down, which happens a lot, you get up bloody. Oh, the joys of field work. Here, here we have another site. This is actually a moche site. And at the time that I was recording this, in the literature, it said that there were no moche fortifications, no moche defensive works. Those are actually dry moats that are cut in here. And I'm standing on a parapet. This is the wall. The breastwork has collapsed, looking out here um, at these dry moats. And raiders would be coming down from the highlands, and this is what they would encounter. And behind this massive wall complex is a town up on a ridge. Uh, so this is what 13 months of field work looks like. Uh, so we have sure drawings, couldn't export our pottery, so everything had to be drawn and photographed. 483 site forms, I recorded 483 sites. Those are the sherds that are going into storage. Uh, 36 rolls of color slide film. This is the pre-digital age. That's El Malcriado, the Brat. This is the 1987 Subaru Brat that uh, we bought for the project that was an absolute piece of crap. I was learning the Spanish words for car parts one part at a time. Drunk director, of course. This is my this is my last night here, and Pilsen Trujillo, the proud sponsor of the Waka de la Luna Archaeological Project for the last twenty years. So, that's a it's a social good drinking Pilsen Trujillo. Okay, and I think this next one is the very last slide. I had thirty six rolls of Kodachrome, thirty six exposures a piece. And this last one was the very last photograph of the project. I don't, I don't think I've, I don't think I've really changed. That <laughs> Is there a change? A few more pounds, maybe? <laughs> and this is the greatest result of the uh, of the Moche Valley project. Uh, for some reason, my wife Lori, who's who's here. Uh, we went down to Peru with her five months pregnant. Woohoo! In the middle of an economic crisis, terrorism, cholera epidemic, and that's Sarah, our oldest daughter, who's now 30, doing her first day of archaeological field work in the Middle Valley. Uh, I have not yet published this method, but uh, you know, babies are very good at survey archaeology because they're close to the ground. They see things, they pick something out. The first thing they do, they put it in their mouth, which cleans it off so you can see the shirt and get the time, you know, see the style of the shirt. It's they just, you gotta get them to go faster though, faster and focus. My favorite slide ever, by the way. 
So uh, how much time do I have left here? Okay, so this is some of the stuff that came out of the survey. One is measuring all these mounds. And this, so this is a proxy measure of how much power leaders have to uh, how much they invested in ceremonial architecture. So this is the formative period here. We get first mound construction. It, it peaks pretty significant size mounds. I mean, as big as anything in North America, as big as Cahokia or bigger than Moundville. I don't get to say that in UNC. So. Bigger than Moundville. Um, and uh, somewhere around uh, 500 BC, 200 BC, all these ceremonial sites are abandoned. Every single one of them, up and down the North and Central Coast, they're all abandoned. And that whole ceremonial tradition, public architecture tradition ends. Uh, we get very little ceremonial construction, and then the Moche state is forming, and boom, leaders are mobilizing massive amounts of labor over a period of multiple generations, several hundred years. So it's not a flash in the pan. They keep doing this generation after generation. Uh, this is a measure of, of warfare. It's very crude, but archaeologists are crude, right? Uh, in many ways. Uh, this shows the percent of sites that are in defensive settings. And so this is that formative period here. Basically, sites are not in defensive settings. And the ceremonial sites are in settings that are basically impossible to defend. They're right up against mountains, and you can come down the mountain right on top of them and raid the place before anyone knows what hits them. This changes dramatically in what's called the early, the start of the early intermediate period. And uh, we get this massive shift. Sites are abandoned, people move up onto hilltops and the first fortifications are constructed in the valley. And this continues each subsequent pay, phase till we get a peak in the middle valley, about 90% of, of the sites are in defensive locations. Moche State forms and we get a little bit of pacification going on in the village. People start moving back down out of the heights, but there's still a lot of tension going on there between the highlands and the coast. Uh, when I mean defensive sites, I'm not, uh, I'm not exaggerating. This is a Gallinasso phase. This is right before Moche State formation. This is a hilltop town site. And these are habitation terraces that have been cut into the hill there. Uh, irrigated fields are a few hundred meters in elevation down here. All the food and water has to be brought up to this location. So they're pretty, they're worried. They're, they're seriously worried in these times. Or as some might suggest, they wanted a good view. <laughs> could be warfare, could be aesthetics, who knows? And if we combine these, we can see how um, there's a correlation between the abandonment of these early mound sites and this onset of what I would call endemic warfare and raiding going on. Now, okay, I was wrong about warfare, so that's we'll get that out there, right there. The biggest surprise other than that was that I started finding these sites, sites with very unusual pottery, strange pottery that was not reported in any publications. And the Moche Valley is probably one of the best studied areas in the Central Andes. There were eight dissertations just on a Harvard project in the 70s. Um, they've been studying ceramics in a systematic fashion for at least 70 years. You have the Viru Valley project in uh, 1948 and the Viru Valley sequence and um, you know, dissertation after book, after monograph, reporting in details of ceramics, which I use to date the sites by time. And these were not recorded. This is sort of like walking across Winthrop and discovering uh, an unknown, a new bird species. I mean, it's just, at first I thought maybe I'm hallucinating. Yeah, but in fact, eventually what I found out is that this style of pottery comes from the highlands above the Moche Valley, and it dates to the period right before the formation of the Moche State. And there are 114 sites that are recorded 
that had this style of pottery. And here you can see them. It's a full range of different types of sites from very large town sites down to, uh, to small hamlets, cemeteries, forts, the whole nine yards. So it looked to me that there was, what I said in my dissertation was an invasion of ethnic Highland people into the Moche Valley. They remained there for a few generations. And then what I proposed, they conquered the Middle Valley. And then eventually they were coastal people unified and forced them out of the valley. And the Moche regained control of the Middle Valley. And that was the beginning of the Moche state. I propose that the main reason for conflict in the Middle Valley and what Highlanders were doing there is to get access to this. Anyone, anyone right now what? <laughs> if you know what this is, you probably should. This is coca, right? So coca, I believe they make something called cocaine out of it. I don't know about that. Uh, but it's sacred in traditional Andean society. They've been growing it for 5,000 years. It's also a narcotic, a stimulant that's chewed on a daily basis. So it's like wine, it can be sacred, but it's also something that you might consume on a daily basis. Uh, and it grows in the middle Moche Valley. The zone is called the Chalpiunga. And in these small pockets in the middle valley on the Pacific coast are the only area that you can grow coca on the Western slope of the Andes. Very small circumscribed area, you control coca fields, it's basically money on leaf. You can take it anywhere and trade it for anything. This is also sweet coca. It's a variety Trujillo coca, uh, which is a good, a, a nice flavor, whereas the coca from the Eastern slopes of the Andes is very bitter. So this is historically highly valued, even today it still is. People grow this for chewing, and they sell it to a, a, a state monopoly that actually produces um, uh, prescription cocaine. Um, I'm not sure what they prescribe it for. Um, and so uh, what I propose is that this was with the conflict. And there are all sorts of historic documents about native people fighting in the Spanish court system over control of the coca fields. And the coastal people would say, we always controlled the coca fields. Uh, we were, uh, you know, we were fierce warriors and Highland people came down and worked for us as slaves in the coca fields. And the Highland people, coastal people are a bunch of wimps. We always came down and kicked their butt. We always controlled the coca fields. Now this was a really great theory, right? So I set out when I was hired at UNC to do household excavations to see if indeed these were ethnic Highland folks, to see if they were invaders, and to see if they were violently forced back out of the valley. Uh, so I did a field school with my, with my wife, Lori, uh, Lori King Billman, for, for many years, I believe 20 field schools over the course of 21 years, which is uh, maybe a record and maybe a record that you don't want to win. Okay, now it was always great fun, except for taking students to the clinic when they get sick. <laughs> so we know historically when the Spanish arrived that in the mountains we have dryland farmers who speak, who spoke Cuyé, a now extinct language, and coastal people who were irrigation farmers and fishermen who spoke Muchik. And the middle valley is in between here where the coca fields here. So we set out to do excavations at Sierra Leone, which is the largest site with Highland ceramics. And this is sort of blurbs on social identity for the cultural anthropologists. They make sure I'm not simple-minded about this. So ethnicity is a social construction. Um, it's flexible, it's situational, it has many, uh, many different manifestations, but it's basically a mental construction. It's something of the mind. So how do you find evidence for a social identity in the material past? And that was our challenge on this project. And uh, we focused on a, we, uh, several things, but the main things I'll talk about here are uh, foodways. 
differences in cuisine. Cuisine is one of the ways that ethnicity is expressed, right? Um, household architecture, the layout, uh, the style, the household grammar, um, and household ritual. And so this is Cerro Reja, which is basically the, the capital of coastal folks in this time period. And there is Sierra Leone, which is on this, uh, we call it a mountain here in North Carolina, in South Carolina, excuse me, but it's a hill in the Andes. And we focused on a cluster of compounds that were the largest domestic compounds on this site. Uh, actually very large and complex site with ceremonial areas and fortifications and at least a thousand people living there uh, at the height. All the occupation is during this 200 year period, about 180 to 200. Uh, so this is a, a cluster of large domestic compounds that we excavated. These are the largest compounds on the site and compound one is the largest domestic compound on this whole town site. Uh, this translates to roughly about 4,800 square feet. A typical suburban home would be about 2,000 square feet. So this is a, this is a big ass home, right? Now this is big. Um, there are three that, what makes this very unusual, especially compared to coastal architecture, which we also excavated, it's divided into three sections. So there is the domestic area, which is accessed up through this quebrada and you enter here and there's a series of patios, two kitchen living areas, lots of storerooms. This is the, the sector of the living here. This is the sector of the dead. So these folks were actually living with their ancestors in a series of stone line crypts, which were accessible uh, through the roof down into here to provide easy access because we'll see they were taking those bodies in and out of those crypts. And the area of the living is separated from the area dead by a massive masonry wall here. And the tombs are actually accessed through an entryway here, not from the living space. Then there's a third area, which is an area of public performance a ritual space that's attached to this domestic compound. The living people would enter this way. Um, the people attending these public presentations would go through an entryway here into a walled patio. And there were a series of stages here. Uh, then there's an area of large scale food production and then the access to the tombs here. So what does this look like? First of all, here we have our chamber tombs, which have been backfilled. And we have this terrace area with a storeroom and huge hearths, burned areas, windbreaks, a grinding stone for production of large quantities of food, feasting, dead people and feasting, right? Adjacent to that, this is the chamber tombs. This is the kitchen area. It's accessed over this way. This is unexcavated here. And to our surprise, after excavation, there are three, there are two terraces here. There's a stairway that comes up to access these. And then there's an access into the kitchen area and tomb area here. And then this is a large public patio, which you could get 100, 200 people in. So what's going on here, we think, is that periodically they're taking out the dead, mummy bundles. Uh, they're preparing a feast. They're inviting people over. The mummies are taken out and rituals are presented on this stage and food and drink is served to folks out here. Okay. There is no precedent for any of this in coastal households in the Moche or in earlier time periods. This is so, so Highland in influence, you can practically taste the potatoes in the cocoa when you, when you look at this thing. I mean, it's, so results here, uh, Jennifer Ringberg did a dissertation that she looked at the, the domestic architecture and the pottery. Uh, first of all, she found that these Highland wares indeed are from the Highlands, they're Highland style, and they were actually manufactured in the Highlands. 
They were not manufactured at Sierra Leone. But about 30% of the population is coastal in style and is coming from the lower valley. So Sierra Leone is sort of a, an intermediary in links between these two groups. And in fact, what we found is lots of exchange going between this highland town and these coastal folks. There were fish from the Pacific Ocean in their trash mittens on the top of a hill in the middle of the desert in the middle valley. They were manufacturing fish hooks um, from sources of metal up in the highland. So there's exchange going on here. Um, now, these, this set of highland wares and sets of coastal wares are different food ways traditions. What she demonstrated by looking at the function of these is they're used to prepare and present food and serve food in different ways. So they're not just stylistic differences, they're differences in the way you prepare food and the way you serve food to people. Interestingly enough, in those public spaces, it's all Highland ceramic styles. It's fancy painted um, bowls for drinking beer out, chicha beer out of, and polychrome pitchers for serving it, and it just screams Highland stuff. You go into the kitchens in that household, and a significant percent of the pottery is coastal. So it may actually be that there's marriage exchange going on. Now that's a hard thing to say, but it's consistent with that. There are simultaneously two different food traditions being used in that kitchen. And for the public sphere, it's Highland, Highland, Highland 24 seven. Very interesting finding. She only had to look at 100,000 shirts to get at that, so, okay. Um, so further, when we put together the thing, these are Highland ethnic people. There may be coastal people at these sites, but these sites are dominated by Highland folks, and there is no hybridity. There, is, there are no forms that are a hybrid of Highland and coastal styles. Even though they were there for 200 years, they maintain that identity. And they use that very, un for the coast, very unusual set of household rituals to proclaim that identity. They also organize their households in a very different fashion. The architecture is different. And uh, even the way they're disposing of trash is different than at coastal sites. However, that conclusion of my dissertation that I subsequently post, we proved was wrong. <laughs> and uh, we have an article coming out eventually here in Latin American antiquity that demonstrates that I was wrong about this. This was not an invasion. This was not a conquest of the valley. These were colonists who moved into the valley uh, who probably were given access to irrigated fields and coca, coca fields, uh, who established themselves at entry points into the Middle Valley, perhaps to defend, perhaps this was an alliance. You come down to the Middle Valley, you stand in the middle of the highway with a spear, <laughs> and you get the coca fields. Um, I was expecting to find these settlements burned, bodies on the floor, catastrophic abandonment. First of all, there's very clear of good, you know, good relationships, exchange, maybe even intermarriage between these groups. groups. Um, when these sites were abandoned, and they were all abandoned around 200 AD, 200, 300 AD, they took everything with them. It was an orderly abandonment process to the extent that in all our excavations, we only found two whole pots. The only person in the history of the Andes that excavated on the coast and only found two whole pots. The tombs themselves were empty, completely empty. How do we know they were tombs if they're empty? Fingers and toes. They were empty except for a few broken pieces of pottery. There was a a projectile point, an arrowhead that was made out of pure crystal. 
It was probably accidentally left behind. And a few of the fingers and toes. So life lesson here. Um, when you have to go out there and dig up that body, you know, that you, you know, <laughs> like, you know, there's an accident at the sorority and you all get together and you bury the in the back there, Rust Creek, and then you read in the newspaper that the sorority is being torn down 20 years later and you need to go back and get that body. Make sure you get the fingers and toes. That was a long way for a very sick joke, wasn't it? Okay. Life lessons, you take them where you can get them. Uh, so the bodies were so valuable to them that they took them when they left. Now here is the mystery that remains. Where did they go? Why did they leave? Now, I think they didn't assimilate because they hadn't assimilated in 200 years. I think they went back to the highlands and they took everything with them. Um, but why they left, we, we do not know, but there's no indication they were forced out. Now, what happens after this is all these sites are abandoned. Waka de la Luna, the site of Moche is founded. All those transformations begin to happen. And there's a huge expansion and irrigation in the Middle Valley. And I think it's the combination of military force and the economic power of the expansion, the construction and expansion of these irrigation systems, which created enough new land for about 20,000 people. Uh, but you could not construct these big canals until you had control, complete control of the Middle Valley and until you had a military force to protect and defend them. So a couple things here as I wrap up. The great thing about archeology span is that for everything you learn, there's another two or three mysteries that come up. And that's not cliche, that's true. Um, the other thing is that uh, if you don't want to be proven wrong, don't propose a theory that, theory that can be empirically tested. <laughs> if you propose something that someone can test, you're probably going to be wrong. And my, my final, I, I take us actually a certain amount of pride in the fact that I have proved myself wrong <laughs> and doing so in press. So uh, that is unique. And I will add one final joke. I have three daughters and three granddaughters and I've been married for a very long time. So I'm used to being wrong. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Billman for an unforgettable performance. And now let's open up the, uh, the hall for questions. Please raise your hand. Any questions? <laughs> I'll, just, I'll uh, defer to the expert on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should go back to the I forgot to mention this one. Uh, slide that I put in for you. So, so. This is me in the field. Here. This is. Apart from when I'm with my granddaughter, this is happy like that, or with my wife. <laughs> you may know a, a suspicious bulge there going on. I have a fat chew token there, and it is legal and sold in the US. Anyway, any other questions or thoughts? Or, uh, if not, we'll adjourn. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious because. Uh, you thought there was no war, and you found there was war, and then you're backpedaling on that one a little bit. But it, that's that's the same kind of thing that's been happening with a lot of cultures in this area. And I'm just curious about uh, how there, there seems like there's military protective sites. Yeah. And I've heard that the Timanaku and the warrior that initially they did have those or they didn't have those. So I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I, I would say, I think what, what holds up about my research, um, or at least I haven't just disproven it uh, yet, <laughs> is this rising that, that for a very long time, there appear to be, there appears to have been very little evidence of time. And what's called the initial period of early growth. 
Now, the thing is, we don't have the bodies from them. And that's ultimately what tells you whether it was warfare or not. It's the trauma for them. So, but just where people are positioned, they're not positioning themselves because they feel threatened by just hours of time. Uh, that happens, seems to change very suddenly. And there's another piece of research that we've done as yet unpublished, which shows that there's a significant increase in the frequency of El Nino's that correlates with the abandonment of those religious structures and on so on. And frankly, I haven't published it because I'm not one of those environmental determinists, El Nino cost at all type of folks. Uh, but it's, it, that's very interesting and uh, it, it could have been you know, considerable stress and uncertainty in the valley because of that. Uh, but we see this sort of rising cycle of violence through culminating just before the merger. And my current thinking is, is that's going on and that's very much a factor that's shaping daily life in the middle valley. And although I haven't really thought about how to test it to prove it. Um, I, I think that those colonists are probably invited into the valley to provide protection. And that's a strategy that we see a lot uh, historically around the world where other groups will be brought in uh, to, to protect the city. Most notably, just south of um, in Oxbatic with Colorado, just south of there in the Midland Valley. When the Apaches and Navajos uh, came in and raided and burned Santa Fe in the 1600s, the response of the Spanish was to free uh, a whole bunch of Indian slaves and establish them at a choke point in the valley to protect, to block that approach of Navajos and Apaches. So they're very much situated in places where you do that. Sierra Leone is right at the choke point of entryway of uh, two routes of entry. From adjacent valleys and two routes from the Middle So I think that uh, may have been going on there. So I think it was an alliance formation and, and as a response uh, to conflict. Now, what, what happens, I was, I was you know, just you know, thinking about it is that at some point, maybe coastal folks were militarily strong enough that they didn't need those folks. And but that remains backward, you know, because I've uh, never quite seen anything like it where everything is. Different. And uh, again, one, now one of my claims to fame is I'm the only Noche archaeologist that excavated to the <laughs> <laughs> so, But I'll say, who needs gold and silver if the empty tomb is a lot more interesting than one with with gold and silver? <laughs> right? More mysterious. <laughs> So, and, and I think with once Moche forms, although this is a minority view, you know, I see, I think I see lots of evidence of, of, of conflict going on of a greater scale than previously, where there are very large numbers of those being put together to go out and defend some of the largest fortifications that we've been about were constructed. The masses and the therapists. Just don't ask for stuff. They're all peaceful. <laughs> and they give you the sacrifice, but it was only men, not women and children. So, what was going on in the Highlands around that time? Farther up? Is that for quiet territory? No, it's. Um, it's a, it's a little known area. It's it's Kuya speaking, where Fly would have been proto Pechua or some form of Pechua. So it's a unique sort of culture area. It's not Wamachuco, it's not the Fly, it's its own thing, and it's sort of this separate sort of island of a uh, very large and very uh, rich potato and corn fields and, um, and some irrigation management. And it, it seems to have its own cultural tradition. And it's not very well known. Uh, John and Jesus probably did some work there. And it appears that in this time period, they're coalescing into fortified town sites. And there are fortified town sites that presumably go through this period that 
you can practice, you can you can see where they are. On the and you can see that you can see the cornfields 10,000 feet. And Lecce Valley rises from uh, zero to 14,000 feet in 30 miles. So every ever look at the mountains, that's, that's about 7,000 feet of elevation. That's twice the elevation. It's so big that when you look at it, you don't think it's that big, but they're 10 to 14,000 feet. One of the most impressive watches, which again, I think creates this sort of type of interaction between you. Yeah. So I'm curious about that interaction. Do you think that which in this going up that you have that sort of class of specialized monocaravans that we might see sort of later? Huh. Period, or what, like, what, do you, what do you think the nature of how that exchange happens? It's it's interesting because um, you know all the all the domestic and ceremonial, with the exception of the coastal stuff, the pots they're cooking on. So about thirty percent, roughly thirty percent of the domestic wares are coming from the water back. Um, there are no clay sources around them for one thing, so they have to go somewhere else. So about seventy percent of the pottery that's used in daily life and use in these occasions are coming from. From the highlands, presumably on non caravans, and you know, cooking pots really don't last. Ceramic cooking pots don't last that long. I mean, it's a very thin wear, so it's probably six months to a year to get a cooking pot. So it's thousands and thousands of vessels that are being transported down to this community over the over period of 250. Uh, so it suggests, you know, major movement by Yamacha. And in fact, on Sarah Leone, there's sort of this protective code where the mountain sort of comes around a little bit. And there are a series of, of large, uh, very simple dry laid uh, compounds, compounds that look like they could be gone off the so not, uh, They're not domestic and they're not here to be ceremonial or anything. Uh, it could be you know, hundreds of technology <laughs> kind of way when you say, Herding up into these crowds. So it's a it's a very significant movement of, of goods. And in my dissertation, I actually said one, I said one theory is that these are coastal people who are training for the pottery, the pottery. And I said, but the volume that would be required is that would be the <laughs> Okay, so we're we're done. I appreciate the questions, and this is a great for now. So uh, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it. I hope uh, I hope you have as well. Thank you. We hope to have you back. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. More questions, please. Down. 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 Yes. Yes. Is that particular case? There, there were four episodes that were separated by. Uh,